and we are live. For some reason, it shows me that we've been live for 15 seconds, but we were not. We're, just, <laughs> we're here now. <laughs> so folks, welcome to another amazing, amazing stream. This time we are streaming from two different sides of the world. I am here. Ah, I can hear myself a bit. <laughs> Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So I will introduce you to Kevin in a second. <laughs> Actually, I'll introduce you to Kevin right now because he's already here on the screen. Um, today, we will talk about robots, and I have an amazing robot maker here in the in live in front of you in flesh. This is Kevin McAleer. Please say hi. Hi. How are you doing? Hi, Kevin. Good, good. We actually we've been talking with Kevin before. Um, about twenty minutes before you guys joined us. Okay, we've been talking about industry stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. Yeah, you worries. are you are streaming from rainy Manchester. Yes, UK. In the UK. Amazing. And I am streaming from rainy Vancouver, Canada. Rainy in both cases. I don't even need to ask at the end of the day. <laughs> awesome. So thank you guys for joining us. Today we'll talk about robots. Um, and I don't know much about robots, but Kevin is an expert. <laughs> there you go. There, there, there's some Nobody receipts. <laughs> Awesome. So, Kevin, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, so I've been uh, streaming on YouTube for probably about four years now on how to make robots. So every every week I will say to people, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code, and have a whole load of fun along the way. So, yes, it's mostly around Raspberry Pis, Python, of course, MicroPython, which you might not have heard of, and robotics. So Perfect. Kind of what Do I you know a bit of engineering and electric and electronics and exactly. coding yes. how do you combine all of it together that's amazing some yeah, of us are struggling just with code <laughs> <laughs> that's it this is what i like about it because it's uh, it's kind of like three overlapping circles of expertise so you've got software engineering uh, python micropython you've got the electrical engineering all the components plugging them together and then you've got the uh, kind of proper mechanical engineering how things fit together physically so I do a lot of 3D printed robots, a lot of robots this kind of size as well, because they're, they're quite easy to make. So this is a little one I call Burger Bot, because it's, uh, it's round. Mm -hmm. And these have a little microcontroller inside them. You can see on this one, it's got a little circuit board just on the top there and a battery underneath. And uh, it's got some motors underneath so it can, it can move about. And if I just uh, press that button there, it'll start to uh, move its little wheels about. So this one can actually go wow. sideways because it's got these weird mechanism wheels on it. So yes, yeah, so that's the kind of mechanical side is the how do you put all this together? The electronics is how you wire everything up. And then the fun part, which is the programming in my. So yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I am very excited about it because I don't know much about robots. And I have to show you something that made me want to make this stream in the first place because I, I was very excited and I need to show it to the people. So I am, of course, talking about the Optimus robot. And I'm going to move a bit so you guys can see how it folds a bunch of laundry, which to me is insane because I usually fold a lot of laundry and I know how difficult it is to do what he's doing now. He's a bit slow. But once I've seen it, I realized that, hey, maybe it's a good time to start learning something about robotics. <laughs> what do you think about it, Kevin? Do you have any thoughts yeah, about this, this Optimus do. guy? I have a lot of thoughts about this. So when I very yeah. first got into robotics, I had a 3D printer. And I was like, what kind of robots can I print with this? I think I started out with a very, very small robot. This one here, uh, it's called a SMARS robot. It's got these little mechanical tracks. And... I explored that and I got bored of that quite quickly and I was like I want a full-size humanoid robot and there is a project which is free uh, you can download all can download all the files for it the head is there you can just this is a uh, inmove it's called inmove.fr and it's by a French designer Gail Langvin and he designed this fully it's almost like a sculpture but you can move all the parts with servos so you just need to print out all the parts connect up all the electronics and then program it. I think it was Java, which is probably why it's terrible. I'm not a big fan of Java. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, I, we do that have a lot my... of Java developers in the audience, Kevin. So I'm, <laughs> I'm warning. <laughs> well, no, I'm joking. So, Actually, here we're we're very open minded towards programming languages. We don't enough. we don't Honestly, mind. <laughs> so, yeah, so, there, there's a bit of Python in everything. There's a bit of Python in everything. So one of the challenges there then is from 
there's a power there's a power problem. So if you think about humanoid robots, if we just take for granted that that's the right kind of robot to build, how are you going to power this robot? Because it takes a lot of power just to stand upright. All those servos are having to sort of constantly adjust so that you're balancing. That doesn't come for free. When we stand up, we're burning a lot of calories just standing still. So just having the robot as a human shape, I would ask, why is that the optimal shape for any solution? Just because that's a, with the shape that we are. Think about like a robot vacuum cleaner. That's like the best shape for a vacuum cleaner because it's close to the ground. It's where it needs to be collecting the dirt. And uh, it doesn't need to be a human shape, sort of, you know, shuffling a, a Dyson or a Hoover or whatever around a melee. Um, so why why a human shape? Why is that the optimal shape for all solutions? It's probably not the best for any solution. So even folding clothes, does it need to have a torso? Does it need a head? Does it just need the arms? So I know the, the factory that makes Raspberry Pis, these little computers, they have um, they have a robot on their production line and it does some of the complicated stuff, but it is actually two arms and they can like get all of the pieces and they can replicate the same pattern of behavior. So that um, Optimus that you just played then, it's a bit of a fake, the video, in so much as that it's not actually seeing the clothes on the on the table. It's just repeating the steps. So if you took that away, it would still carry on the same steps. Mm -hmm. And they had to film that quite a few times for it to work. And I believe that's the same with quite a few of the Boston Dynamic ones when you see it. You, you, you never really see the outtakes where it smashes to pieces or doesn't quite make the parkour or whatever. So, of course, it's a well thought of marketing campaign exactly. in the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's one of the, the challenges in robotics. Some of the simplest things are actually the hardest to do. And then some of the hard things for humans to do are really easy for robots to do. So you need to find that sweet spot and then just home in on that. It's so amazing things... because we can say the same about AI. Yes. Artificial intelligence is also along these lines, right? Things that are very easy for humans are very difficult for artificial yeah. intelligence and the other way around. It's that's amazing. Right. And sometimes it, it comes from left field, like large language models weren't a thing five years ago. And then all of a sudden the processing power, even the processing power on one of these small Raspberry Pi computers, they can now run something the size of like chat GPT oh, on wow. an embedded device without any internet connection. So public wow. model objects, nano type. So yeah, you can do things like that. And that means you can interact with it with text uh, and come up with new creative ways and ways that we couldn't do five years ago so yeah that's Some awesome things come, come from left field <laughs> i think that in the end of the day the reason why everyone is trying to make humanoid robots is because of hollywood we all yeah. grew up watching these films uh we all had fantasies of having our own assistant who is a robot yes. you know or maybe our own terminator <laughs> 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 but um i think that um I think that basically our imagination, our collective imagination drives innovation. Um, and I agree that humanoid robots may not be the best solution for folding laundry and doing all kinds of stuff. My question is, in the future, if we come up with this perfect shape of a robot, right? How do we know that this is the perfect shape? Isn't it something that we develop with time, right? Um, how many legs does it have? How many um, sensors, right? Um, yeah. And, and walking, interesting. that's quite a hard thing for robots to do as well. You'll see there aren't that many walking robots. There are lots with wheels because wheels are easy to do. Tracks and um, just regular wheels are, are easy to do. But actually standing as a bipedal robot that can walk, that's really hard to do. You need all kinds of inertial measurement units that can detect the, the robot if it's falling and then correct for that and do that many times a second. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's it's not an easy thing, to, not an easy challenge to uh, to fix. It's expensive as well because if the robot falls over and breaks, you've got to then repair it. So, yeah, not something we can easily Absolutely. 3D print. I do have a robot dog here actually. I got sent this by a company. Wow! How oh, cool is that? It's, it's wow. a really high powered one, so I've not quite wired all this up yet. But this is a this got four legs that can it can walk about. Got quite a few dog robots. I don't know why people also like to produce those, but this one's particularly cute. So I think that robot dogs don't need to go outside three times a day, and maybe That's it's a true. good solution. <laughs> Somebody who loves you unconditionally yeah. and fully clean. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. <laughs> so, folks, if you'd like to see how to build those robots that Kevin is showing you, guess what? Kevin is doing it four years. He's showing you everything from scratch. There you go. You can see a bunch of examples there on the screen. 
And that's actually my favorite robot. <laughs> I already recognize it from a di distance. Yes, actually, I'll try and switch it on and see if I can get the, uh, the batteries and the wires and everything. Mm -hmm. So this is Booba. He's actually got a damaged eye. So you can see the eyelid looks slightly closed. And that's because I, I burnt the servo out. <laughs> I took it to a, a, an event in Rome and it was it was on for about three days straight. There we wow. go. So his eyes are flashing now. You can see. I put it on wow. the uh, that camera there. It might be easier to see. So his wow. beaks open and closing. <laughs> so this is entirely 3D printed. Um, so this is a steampunk robot based on Bubo from Clash of the Titans. So it's steampunk styled. Yes, yeah, entirely 3D printed. Has a Raspberry Pi 5 inside. And inside one of the eyes, if I hold this really close to the camera, you might be able to tell that there is actually a camera inside the eye there. Mm. See that? Wow. So it can run Python and OpenCV. So it can do face detection, it can do hand detection, and it can actually detect how many fingers you're holding up. So if you do a peace sign in front of Bubo, hold it for three seconds, it will take a picture, it'll add a overlay to it saying, I met Bubo at whatever event it is, and then it'll tweet and toot that out um, to social media. Wow. So that's wow. Selenium, so probably. <laughs> hmm? Selenium? Mechanical soup? Um, so it uses, um, I, th I think, some quite bespoke, like uh, Tweepy, I think, for tweeting, and Instabot for Instagram. So they're gotcha. all Python libraries that you can use. That's awesome. And we actually have some questions from the awesome. audience. Huh? Let's, go Let's pull them out. Let's see. So the Emerald Wolf is asking, Kevin, do you think it would be a good idea to make a robot that would send into a black hole? that we would send into a black hole. <laughs> yeah. So if you think some of the earliest robots that we've made are ones that are in space, like the Voyager space probe is a robot because it's, if you think, what is a robot? If you used to define what a robot is, be interested to know what your viewers think it is. So I would define it as any kind of um, machine that's running a program and can take inputs. It can decide on what to do based on those inputs and then it will output or control itself in some way. So there's kind of a, a loop. So that doesn't mean to say that it has arms and legs necessarily. It could just be like a space robot with solar sails, but it can at least adjust its sails towards the sun. Um, but it's sending back data all the time of things that it's uh, it's seeing with its sensors. So, yeah, if you think about um, space probes, certainly I think that we will probably send probes as close to a black hole as you can get before you reach that event horizon. Then you, you can't get any signal beyond that point. But there's probably a good margin where it's getting data back from that very edge. The problem with black holes is time dilation. <laughs> I'm not a physicist, <laughs> by the way, but I understand the closer you get to a black hole, the slower it seems to be um, for people who are outside that. So it would just seem to stop as it gets closer. And therefore, the data coming back would cease for years at a time the further it gets in. If you look at the, the movie the black, um, Interstellar, they talk about that quite a bit. Oh, I, I love think. this movie. I, yeah. It's one of my favorite movies out there very very inspiring i agree to me to me it seems that if we send something into a black hole it will take a lot of years to get there and by the time it gets there we don't really know if it will ever come back so yes. somebody needs to be very brave with his capital to do so elon yes <laughs> probably do you want to do I mean, it elon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any cash left after the twitter purchase yeah well, well certainly <laughs> robots in, in in dangerous environments is is a thing so think about Chernobyl when that happened mm -hmm. they sent these robots in I think they have two robots from the uh, Russian space program and one of the challenges they had was that these robots were designed for use in space and space does have um, cosmic radiation but it doesn't have a lot of radiation it's just kind of background um, whereas on a nuclear power station that's just blown up there's a lot of radiation that actually interfered with the chips so the uh, the microcontroller chips stopped working the memory got flooded um, and it basically just ceased to work. So unless they could put lead all the way around it and that makes it heavier, needs more power to, to move. But they do use robots in uh, nuclear decommissioning. I'm quite aware of that. I did work for a nuclear company. Oh, uh, wow. Holy smokes, <laughs> Kevin. That's some revelations. <laughs> Amazing. So, Kevin, you have a full-time job. You yes. are in a management position. You are a very busy guy. What made you want to you know, start contributing your time towards teaching others, you know, what, what drove yeah. you to this conclusion? That's a great question. So 
when I was, um, I, I did a degree in computer science uh, about 94 to 98, I think it was. And at the end of that, I carried on working at the school that I actually went to as a student. So I got a job there part time while I was doing my degree. And then after I got the degree, I kind of went into IT support, effectively just managing the IT systems there. And there was kind of a fork in the road when I got to my 30s. I'm um, in my late 40s now. And I was thinking, do I either go down the software development route as a programmer? Do I become more IT support, but there's a lot of qualifications that you need to constantly maintain, so it's quite expensive. They don't pay that great either. Or do I go down the purely management route where I do like project management? So I went down the project management route because that was the most lucrative route to go down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I always miss the programming side. I always miss that side of it. So um, when was it? Like I said, about four years ago when I started live streaming, the reason I got into doing videos was... I wanted to make these little smiles robots. So these stand for um, screwless modular accessible robotic system. I didn't design this. I've just printed many of them and extended it. So the idea is that it, you can pull all these parts off. There's no screws involved. Everything sort of snap fits together. And I love these, but there was nowhere where that had all the information about how to make these. There was on like Thingiverse and there was some code in GitHub repositories, but no kind of single website. So I started a website called Smiles Fan. Um, and I amassed all the information about these, how to make them and so on. Some of it was just for my own use, really, because I wanted to remember what I'd found and have it all in one place. Um, and I and the website was doing OK, but I thought it's missing something. It's missing video content. So how do you design one of these or build one? All that kind of stuff. Um, and that kind of got me liking robotics even more than I did when I was just tinkering about with it, because it it's like, what's the next thing I want to show people? So mm -hmm. there's an element of like show and tell. I, I enjoy that. Um, and I've always loved teaching. I've always loved that um, learning things and sharing what I've learned because I don't know everything. I, I, what I do know, I just like to share people just like yourself, Maria. You, mm -hmm. You've learning things. You want to share what you've learned. And Absolutely. Kind of like a self-documenting thing as well. So, if, you know, you can go back and watch that video. How did you do that thing in Docker? You've got a video about it. So absolutely. Very often I go back to older mm -hmm. videos where I yeah. solve the problem that I'm now facing many years after. Um, it's kind of I, I definitely see it as bookmarks. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I figure that out. OK. And if I ever forget it, guess what? I covered it for myself. And then yeah. a lot of people enjoyed it as well, uh, which is always a bonus. <laughs> That's it. And That's the other thing is, as, as well as it being a bit of a narcissistic thing, <laughs> I like people saying, like, well done. Um, the other side of it is that you finish stuff. So, you know, if I'm making this this burger bot, for example, so this can uh, draw, like, lines and things. It's got a little pen, a little Sharpie in it, and uh, two little wheels. If I just if I thought about this, I might never actually get around to making it. But if I know I've got a show on Sunday, I might mm -hmm. think, what do I need to prepare for that show? What can I? What's of value to people to learn? So it might be about how you control the servos in MicroPython. It might be how you write the MicroPython, how you upload it. There's so many different aspects. How you design the the 3D design, how you wire up the electronics how you could modify it. There's so many different directions you can go in. And that's just like with one robot. So yeah, I, I like, and, and I like the fact that you can delve into the electronic side. And if you get bored of that or stuck, you can then pivot and look at the software side or the mechanical side. And you can basically just keep rotating and never get bored. Yeah, you I pick and get, choose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I never get bored of, of uh, computing anyway. I love computing. There's so many things that you can learn and, you know, even with Python, there's so many things you can do with that. Um, mm. Whenever there's a problem, I'll be like, I'm sure we can solve that with Python. I just need to figure out how. So here's a, here's a little example. Uh, I was wanting to learn Fast API. I've learned Flask in the past, but Fast API, I'd not learned that before. And I thought, what would be a really good thing to try with that? So my website, kevsrobots.com, is statically generated. I, I have some markdown files. You run it through Jekyll. And then it produces a, a beautiful website. But those pages are not kind of interactive. They're just flat mm. pages. And I wanted to build a search engine. And I thought, that sounds like a really big task to do. It turns out it's not. It's actually really trivial to do with Python. So I used Flask mm. API to build a very simple search API. And um, I used um, yeah, Flask API and um, UVCon, I think it's called, to host it. Put mm -hmm. that into a Docker container. It's running on one of the little computers behind me. There's the four little Raspberry Pis just there. 
and uh, they're running Kev's robot. They're running my empire. And they mean, nice. that, yeah, so they index the site. They use beautiful soup to uh, strip out all the HTML and just provide the uh, the raw text. It uses SQL Lite to store all that for each page, each page, a thumbnail of the page and the page title and description. It puts that as a, a row in a database. And then Fast API basically just exposes that to the web. So it's really simple to do. It's like an afternoon's work. And that's like tidying up as well and document it. So yeah, really, really fun to that's do awesome. stuff like that. We had a lot of questions about Fast API, uh, not not in this specific stream, but like throughout the time, a lot of folks are using it. And there's yeah. all kinds of questions here. Actually, some of them are from my friends. So we have a persistent here, a moderator of our channel, um, as well as Discord. I love automating things around the house, like pull chemicals, curtains. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. And we actually have a question here. Um, has Kevin incorporated LLMs into any of his projects? Ah. Well, isn't that funny? So the show I did last night was about how to run <laughs> Olama on a Raspberry Pi 5 and use Langchain, which is like a Python library, to access that. So you can you can basically use um, Olama, which is like a free local private version of ChatGPT. And it has a web web user interface very, very similar to, um, to ChatGPT. And you can basically use that uh, in any of your projects for free with no subscription, no no paid for service. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we, we will do some Llama stuff as well on the channel, probably even this month uh, or this month or the next one. Um, it's really, really cool. The thing about LLMs is that they require a lot of processing power. So my question is, can you actually run it on something like Raspberry Pi or do you need something fancier like an NVIDIA Jetson Nano, right? Yes. So you absolutely can run it on a Raspberry Pi 5. So on the show I did last night, you can see that basically all four cores of the CPU max out while it's doing the, uh, wow. the query. But it does the query as fast as ChatGPT4. So it's pretty fast. It's not as fast as like the 3, wow. the turbo model, but pretty fast. But yeah, if you've got a Jetson Nano, like one of these little boards here, this great big heat sink on the top is on top of the GPU. And this thing is like really, really fast at doing stuff like that. So it's quite a specialized thing. I think um, Google have a Coral chip you can use as well to offload all that kind of processing. As a Raspberry Pi, I mean, these things are pretty low power compared to like a desktop computer, but Raspberry Pi 5 is pretty fast. I think it's uh, comparable to like a 2015 MacBook Air power-wise. Oh, wow. So it's pretty, That's pretty good. very fast, you yeah. know, because uh, people are saying, <laughs> they always say that things are slow, okay? But then a new version comes out and then guess That's what? It. Guess who's not slow anymore? Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Uh, we have a comment from Anoni. Awesome. Let's let's pull him out. I enjoyed the part where he talked about what made him make videos and publish it, IT oh. content. Mm -hmm. yes. Awesome. I'm just reading some of the comments just, just so folks can see that we, we read it. We see ya. <laughs> <laughs> and I will pull it out if you guys have a question. Um, I3 or I5? That's the question uh, when it comes to Raspberry Pi. What kind of a processing core does it have? Yeah, so these have an ARM processor. So these are not Intel-based. They're uh, ARM-based. Mm. ARM's a, a, it was a UK-based uh, invention. They, they actually made the very first home computers. If you've, uh, oh. back in the 80s, there was like a, the BBC Micro. That had an ARM processor in it. The company that made them became ARM, and then ARM got bought out. Did NVIDIA buy them? I can't remember. But yeah, they, they're very somebody true. big. <laughs> really big. But yeah, these are an ARM processor. It's 64 bit. Uh, you can get them with uh, eight gig of RAM. I think that's the, the maximum. But they have these these pin pin headers on the top there. I don't know if you can see these like little pins that are sticking out there. And that means that you can plug things into them. So not only can it do cool things on the inside, but you can plug things into them to make like robot stuff. You can make them control things. So yeah. uh, one of your viewers was saying about home automation. You can do a lot of home automation with Raspberry Pis. So my, my home is automated through that. <laughs> you hear it, Josh? Look into look into Kevin's channel. That's going to be very, very beneficial for you. If you want to keep automating curtains. curtains. Yes. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So we have here another question. And this one is about money. What is yeah. the most expensive robot that you own slash made? Let me get and it. Ah, there you go. We have a live example, folks. Amazing. So we get to we get to see all of Kevin's workshop, or at least big portions of it today. <laughs> <laughs> so this robot I was uh, given by um, 
a company, Electrics. I think they're a Chinese company. It comes in this like really nice case. Let me open this up and show you what's inside. So inside here is another robot dog. <laughs> Amazing. Let me show you this one because it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's got enough power because it, it might, yeah, I think it needs charging up. But this has a Raspberry Pi inside. Let me just get its limbs down. And it's made entirely of metal. So it's not like the uh, the 3D printed wow. ones you've seen before. It even has like a, a bit like Spot Micro. It has a, an arm on the top. So inside there is a Raspberry Pi. It's one of these mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi compute modules. They're a really small version of a Raspberry Pi. And the idea is uh, it just contains all the bits you need and nothing that you don't. So that's inside that uh, little face at the front there. But yeah, this can do all kinds of tricks. And these are about a thousand pounds, thousand dollars. Wow. So pretty expensive, but they're really, really good quality. You can see the limbs, they move, they move in all kinds of degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. it's so it's metal. pretty durable. Yes. And do you much. need to program it yourself or does it come pre programmed? So it comes pre programmed with some demo programs, but you can entirely program this in Python, of course. So wow. the entire Python library. But yeah, that's a pretty expensive robot, that one, thousand dollars. Mm. that's awesome next question <laughs> it's amazing that all the questions almost all of them come from the audience uh kevin and i we didn't prepare for this stream because the last time when we spoke it was an amazing conversation and we could have spoken for more hours uh we just have a lot of things to say so we thought let's just wing it let's see <laughs> let's let's have a topic of robots and we'll let the audience ask so thank you guys so much for participating uh next question what language do you prefer pre prefer for a raspberry pi yeah it's a good question so i the, one of the reasons i love python that's my main answer <laughs> is because of the development cycle so if you if you use something like c which is much faster than raspberry pi uh, the, the micro, than python than python or micro python um it's much faster but the compile time means that it takes a lot longer to develop software because if you change something you fix a bug you've got to wait while it compiles and then you check it and there's another bug, you know, and that whole development cycle just stretches out the time it takes to make something. Whereas with Python, you get the answers right away. So yes, it might be a bit slower at some things, but things like ChatGPT, they run on Python. So they could run thousands of times quicker if they were made in C, but there's a reason that they don't use that. And it's because it takes a long time to develop stuff when you have to compile it all the time. So it's great for optimizing things once you have the solution. So I know that that uh, language uh, Mojo is looking to try and address that. It's kind of a hybrid between Python and the compile time that you get from C, C++. So yeah, I love Python and MicroPython. So I'll just show you one of these little controllers. Yeah, so tell this... us a bit more about MicroPython. I think yeah. that's, that's what mostly people want to hear. So this is a Raspberry Pi. I think this is Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. Was it Raspberry Pi? That's all. I don't suppose it really matters, but this is Raspberry Pi 3, so it's about two or three generations old. So this is a full computer. It runs Linux. It has, you know, USB ports, a network cable connector. You can connect a camera in it, and it has a little micro SD card that runs the operating system. That's where it stores the file system. So this can run like full Python. It can run websites. It can do everything. And these are about $35 up. So I think you can pay up to like $110 for the latest, greatest Raspberry Pi. Now then there's these other things which are called microcontrollers. So this looks similar. It's got the green kind of circuit board. It's got the main chip in the middle there. Uh, that's the main processor, I'm trying to get it in focus there. And it also has a USB connector on one end. Let's see if I, it's trying to focus on my mm -hmm. face, there we go. And um, it also has a couple of buttons and it has these pins as well. So these pins enable you to connect to other things. So the idea is that you, you write programs for this, you connect it up. So for example, this robot that I have here has one of those plugged into a little socket there. Mm. So that can control the robot. It has a, a silver chip on there. That's the Wi-Fi chip. So you can connect to it by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And that runs MicroPython. So MicroPython is like a really scaled down re-implementation of Python for microcontrollers. And microcontrollers have a lot less memory. So whereas a Raspberry Pi might have gigabytes of memory, this has kilobytes of memory, not even a megabyte. Wow. Kilobytes of memory, really small. They're 32-bit, wow. so they are 
they're uh, much more powerful than, say, an Arduino, if you know what Arduinos are. Um, so they are quite powerful, and that's how they can connect to the, uh, the internet. But they don't have gigabytes of memory. They have no file system per se. They just have um, a little RAM chip that does everything on there. So it has a, a tiny bit of space for files, but not very much. You, you basically eat it into um, the storage that's on these things, which is barely anything. Um, and processor-wise, it's, uh, it's another ARM processor. Um, I think this one actually is um, designed by Raspberry Pi themselves, RP2040. Um, but MicroPython is developed by a separate organization. So Damien George is the creator of MicroPython, written in C, uh, but it, it's compatible with Python. So if you have a Python program, it more than likely will run on one of these as long as it doesn't require too much resources. So you'll not be able to run like ChatGPT or anything like that on one of these, but you can make a robot move around, which is pretty cool. I'm actually very excited by this by this micro Python chip because yeah. finally I understand why would anyone need the big O notation? <laughs> very exactly. basically looking at algorithms, there's when you're limited with resources and which which what it sounds That's like it. this chip is, you finally find a use to it. Okay. So if you're particularly good with algorithms, <laughs> exactly. you can rock it, right? For me, it's a bit more difficult. I'm working with a lot of RAM, so <laughs> I'm never thinking about resources, but that's why I like Python so much. Um, yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons I like robotics. You can start really simply with like these small robots where essentially just you're just moving wheels backwards and forwards. You're just turning a motor on and off um, or telling it which direction to turn and how fast if you're getting more sophisticated. And then you've got things like these it looks like an eyes on the front. These are actually ultrasonic range finders. So it bounces oh, wow. out a sound wave. One of them's a, a microphone and one's a speaker. So the speaker will pulse out a sound. And when that sound hits something and reflects back, the microphone can hear that. And what it can do is it can, it can count how long does it take for that signal to bounce back. And if you have that, you get the distance to the object. So wow. if you think you have to go there and back, that's why you have to have it. You just want the how far is it to that. And they're surprisingly accurate. So this can measure, you know, 30 centimeters very accurately. So as it gets closer and closer, you can make it stop and then mm -hmm. reverse and turn around and avoid something just with those very simple. Um, and basically, it's just like two pins on the uh, on the, the device. You just send out a signal and you listen for the signal to come back. So they're a bit like writing a, a game loop in a, in a game. You basically just have a loop that goes around. Has something happened? Yes or no? If not, go around the loop again. So it's a very, very simple program. But That's something awesome. like um, this other robot I've got on my desk over here, this one here, this one has a LiDAR on top. So this one has a laser beam in this uh, this thing that's spinning around. If I just grab that for a second, it's spinning round. And that laser beam is basically sweeping round and mapping the environment so it can see where it is. A bit like the ultrasonic rangefinder, but it's spinning round very, very, very fast. And the laser means it's very accurate as well. So this can actually move around and map its own environment. It's like a little cube shaped robot. And uh, I've actually got this one plugged in at the moment. I'll see if I can uh, make this move backwards and forwards. So if I go to there and then I hit, yes, I can make it to move backwards and forwards. Wow. <laughs> left and right. And I can see that the environment that it's mapping as well. Um, might be able to bring that up perhaps. That's so cool. <laughs> you always think about, um, you keep thinking about computer vision when you're thinking about robotics, but it seems that you don't really need to have cameras to, right. to to calculate distance and wow i'm amazed that's right. that's right computer vision has come on leaps and bounds particularly with the python library open cv open computer vision so you can do things like detect faces hands gestures body posture you can measure the angle between your arm and your your forearm you can measure that very accurately using open cv it's like so simple to use it's, it's it feels like it's cheating to be honest so i love open cv i love yeah, it it's one of my favorites yeah it means that you can do all kinds of co cool stuff with robots you can make it follow a face if, if it's mm. um a camera that's on like a, a gimbal that can pan and tilt you can basically follow a face round that's really simple to do because you're basically just saying where is the face in the image and try and center it by moving units mm -hmm. to, to make, keep it in the center and that, again, looks like magic when you've got that working. And for me, programming, if you think about the joy you get from programming when something works the way you expect it to, imagine that but with a physical object where it moves the way you expect it to. It achieves the thing like it draws a picture, you know, the way you expect it to. It's like programming times 10. It's like mm -hmm. a multiplier because it's physical and real. 
it's the physical manifestation of your software basically it's, it's amazing i love it we have another question this one is about rust is Ooh. rust used in robotic software engineering side more so than before yes um, i know quite a few people who are looking again for that speed that you get with c++ or that ease of use of python they're going to rust because it's kind of giving them the best of those both worlds so more and more people are running python uh, running rust on things so one of the challenges is there are so many different circuit boards out there these are all micro controls i'm holding up here these are just ones i had um sort of to hand there's so many of them and each one of them has different amounts of memory a different processor and they've all seemed to uh, center around MicroPython. They pick that as a, a platform that they can all be supported by. So it will take quite a bit for Rust to be supported on all of these different boards. But you can take a program written for one microcontroller and run it on a completely different controller. And nine times out of 10, it'll work without any changes. So trying to do that with Rust, they would have to support every microcontroller that's come out there rather than it just being supported because the community has invested that time already so absolutely it takes than, time yeah, to adapt time. yeah that's awesome we actually had another question but this one i'm pretty sure that you know i already know the answer because it usually depends on your preferences okay i'm, I'm making a guess i don't know <laughs> kevin i'm sorry that i guessed but i wonder which is better uh for it raspberry pi or arduino so yes I do love Arduino, I've got to say. Um, I, I met Massimo, the uh, the inventor, Massimo Banzai, the inventor of the Arduino at the Rome Maker Fair last year. So that was a great honor. Well, I, I walked up to him and he recognized me, which was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> a lot to me that, because I, I put a lot of uh, content out there on Instagram and he's a big Instagram user. But um, yeah, for me, the Arduino is a great learning platform. Um, you can, it's quite robust, they're quite cheap. Um, and there's a lot of documentation out there. There's a lot of projects out there already. So they're great for kind of hands-on Internet of Things type projects. I think I've got, um, I've got a, a small Arduino compatible Nano there. That's a, one of the little chips that they have. But for me, Raspberry Pi, they're a UK company. So I've kind of got that in the favor. And the fact that they make full computers, not just Internet of Things boards, not microcontrollers, but full computers... For me, this is this is the be all and end all. Single board computer does everything you need it to do, and it's like I said, running four little Raspberry Pis just behind me, are running my entire empire, kevsrobots.com. Uh, it's running on that, so uh, you know, I love it. <laughs> I love it for awesome. that reason. I'm uh, sadly still using Wix. <laughs> One day <laughs> I'll make my own proper website with Python, <laughs> of course. But until then, um, Wix is my way to go. Um, we have a question. Oh, we have a review about Arduino. Let's see. Ooh. I hated Arduino when I first started because they, the RPI, Raspberry Pi, had Python. Yes. I understand they have MicroPython now. Correct. There you go. Yes. So the original, let me see if I've got um, an Arduino to hand. The original Arduino was 8 bits. So you can't do a lot with that. The, the amount of memory is limited to how many, how many bytes can you count with 256 bits? It's not, it's not a lot. So <laughs> eight bytes really limits you. With 32 bytes, you can you can access four billion units of RAM, so four gig of RAM. So you immediately have got that much more capability to do stuff with. So microcontrollers at 8-bit are fine for, like robotics would be fine, but you can't do like face detection with an 8-bit chip. That's just too much RAM required. It can't store an image in memory. Whereas with one of these, you can do that. And with a Raspberry Pi, even more so, you know, they've got gigabytes of memory now. So, and the fact it can run the full stack of Linux and Python, you can do so much more with that. And that does mean that it's a bit more complicated perhaps because you're running a full computer, but in some ways that might also make it easier. So yeah, For you sure. can actually run the Visual Studio code on a Raspberry Pi. So you can write program, write Python, and have the full Python, running on a single board for $35. Nice. nice. So I was at a conference where MicroPython was used to create a yes. weather station. Could this be scaled up and how accurate can it get? 
It's a tough, tough question. It's <laughs> a great question. Right, let me just get my screen open here and I'm just going <laughs> to type in a weather.clusteredpie.com. So if I go over to here, why have I got the wrong screen? Let me just move that over there. Can you see that okay now? There's like a Grafana yes. screen. Yes. Yes. Right, so if I just log into this, there we go. So this is my weather station. It's running Python to connect to all my weather station. Oh, let, me, let me just connect to it locally, in fact. Three, 3,000. There we go. Right, so if I go to my weather station, I've got all my weather information. It's raining outside at the moment, so I can probably find the, the rain levels if I look over the last six hours, for example. You can see the rain level. It's not I raining told you it's raining. I told <laughs> <Yep>. you. <laughs> It's really warm in the summer house at the moment. I don't. I think it's about two degrees inaccurate that, so it's probably it's about twenty four degrees, which is a bit toasty. Let's turn that down a bit. Uh, you can see the light levels. You can see the air pressure, the uh, the, the gaseous uh, substances that are in the uh, environment, and so on. So all this data is being pulled from sensors um, that uh, are running MicroPython. So I've got a weather station just outside the robot lab, um, and and it has a number of sensors. An anemometer, which measures the uh, the wind speed. It has a weather vane to wind direction. It's got a rain sensor, which is kind of like a seesaw. So it fills a little bucket up with water, tips, and, and it basically just keeps tipping. And each time it tips, it clicks one tick to say that's a unit of rain or whatever. So they all come down into a little Raspberry Pi, which is just in the corner of the studio there. That has a Raspberry Pi hat on top that has that connects the sensors to the raspberry pi and then it runs python to grab all those sensor readings and then i use node red which is a home automation system i think that's node base isn't it which is like javascript mm -hmm. behind the scenes and that will add some extra data to that like this is with the summer house this is the time that the, the sensor reading was taken at and it shoves it into an influx database which is like a time series database and then i've got grafana on top of that which it just makes pretty dashboards from all that data, that time series data. So that whole home automation system is again running on those Raspberry Pis just behind me using Docker or containers so that I can very quickly build and tear it down in code. So you absolutely Incredible. can do very accurate measure me measurements of uh, weather and become like a citizen data scientist. You can publish your data and uh, help help the weather forecast. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. So <laughs> what I like about this stream is that people are asking questions if something is possible in theory and you're like, yeah, I already have it. I figured have it, it out. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Here's an example. Exactly. Amazing. Amazing. This is how you know you're talking to a professional. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blush, Kevin. I'm sorry. I, re I really like your work. And I think the fact that you can talk about it so freely without getting ready, without having a predefined set of questions, it's that's what I appreciate about creators in the end of the day. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see what else we have here. Um, I bought a book from Amazon. It came today and it was different than I imagined. I'm pretty sure it was written by ChatGPT or other AI model. I had a feeling about it. And now it said, let's see, in the previous response. Okay, yeah, so it looks like uh, your book was auto-generated. <laughs> I yeah, agree. If the, first, if the first sentence is sure, <laughs> yeah, then, certainly, <laughs> you know, they've, they've cheaped out. Well, that's disappointing I, that they've used Chat GPT to write the entire thing. I mean, you know, I'm sure it can help you um, create like a structured outline for something, but writing the entire content, I think, is a bit. For cheap. me, I wasn't very impressed. Uh, recently, a friend of mine, he's he's making a nice LinkedIn post and he's like asking me, Maria, is it good? Is it nice? And you use ChatGPT. And uh, basically, I noticed the word embarking. And I wonder, I live in Canada for 10 years. I talk <laughs> about a lot of topics. I have never heard the word embarking in a conversation. <clears throat> oh, <stop laughs> it's amazing. Out. I talked about credenza many, many times, but embarking? <laughs> Embarking. No, it's it's just using some words that are clearly not conversational from what yeah. I understand. Plus, when it comes to kind of you explain what you want the post to be about, I don't think that it's <laughs> specifically conveying your point. I think it yeah. has some nice examples of other posts that were viral, but I don't think it will say what you actually want it to no. say. Um, I have used um, 
not chat GPT. I use some software called Descript. So when I've done like a YouTube video, there's a lot of content in there that you can reuse. So if you use Descript, it will transcribe your entire video from speech to text. And wow. then you can say, now make a blog post about this and it will transcribe your text. It will summarize the main points in it and it will use your own language uh, to create a blog post. Now you can see that that has been kind of, because of the same reason you've just said, it uses some words that I wouldn't use or it will paraphrase in a way that I wouldn't paraphrase. So I always think, well, it's a good starting point. I like what it's done there, but I'm getting rid of that and I'm adding in this. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time on my videos, I'll do a kind of show and tell format. So I might do some slides to say, this is the learning point and then do a demo on the overhead and on screen shares. So when I'm doing the demo on the screen shares, there's no text necessarily it can transcribe there because it's all visual. So mm -hmm. there's bits that are missing there. So I have to fill in the gaps. But it is quite useful to sort of summarize stuff like that, that you might not, you know, might have taken you a while to, to find that or find good clips. There's an option to say, find me the best parts of this video. How does it know? But it does. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's, uh, it's becoming better and better with time. And I think the more people use it, the better it will become. And the question yes. is, I guess... There's a lot of questions, but we're not going to talk about AI here. We are here to talk about robotics because it's a never ending. It's a never ending story. It's very philosophical, I think, when it comes to AI. Um, but we do have a question. We have uh, Kevin. I am a decent programmer and a web is kind of now started to get boring to me. I am thinking of getting into robotics. Is getting a master's degree in robotics a decent option to go for? I would definitely start tinkering about with robotics before you start embarking on uh, embarking on I agree a, <laughs> a <master's degree. laughs> because that's quite a big commitment to do a master's degree I mean probably you know robotics isn't for everyone I would say everyone has some core skills that they can bring to robotics think about those overlapping Venn diagrams again so if you've already got a really strong programming background then you can probably look at areas of programming that other people will be scared to look at. So, for example, this robot that I've got on the desk that's doing the uh, uh, the LiDAR, how does it know where it is in its environment? How does it actually map that? So the, the, the sort of trigonometry that's going on there where it's bouncing things off walls and then making a 3D map of that. And if, that, if it's moving around within that 3D map, how does it know it's moved? because the data is different than it was before. And all those algorithms that figure that stuff out are fascinating. And that's, I think, where if you're a programmer, you'll probably get a lot of value out of learning how, how SLAM works, simultaneous localization and mapping, because it's just really rich with algorithms and clever ways of doing things that you would think, I wouldn't have thought of that, that is so clever. If you've not done like electronics before, that could be a new area of skills to develop. So soldering, electronics together, voltages, impedance, um, all that kind of capacitors and stuff like that. All these things. Sounds are like new. you need to watch yeah. Kevin's channel before exactly. you start a degree. <laughs> Check out some yeah. of his work because he explains it really, really well. And you can buy um, kits. His... Yeah, you can get kits that can help you sort of kickstart that and you can modify them from there on. So mm -hmm. yeah, dive, dive in, try a few things out, see what, see what you like, what you don't like. What is the best kit that you recommend for a beginner? That's Where, a where's the good starting point? That's a really great question. So there are lots of companies like um, like Sunfounder. They produce this uh, robot. And um, it, you, you, you get what you pay for, I think, with robots. So this one might cost, say, oh, I, I don't know, maybe $50 to $100 because it's sort of made of metal. Um, mm -hmm. But it's got a lot of stuff on there. It's got motors that will move around. It's got ultrasonic rangefinders and a camera. You plug your own Raspberry Pi in. It can make sounds. That's quite cool when you can make things talk and listen to speech, speech recognition. Um, if you buy one of these kits, it can take you a long way. You can, you can figure stuff out. And then at some point you'll be like, I want to do more than that. I want, I want that LiDAR thing I can see there. How do I make that work? So it can, you kind of grow um, at your own speed with it. So yeah, I started out with these really simple 3D printed robots. This one, this SMARS robot. Um, you can see it's got the range finder on the front. It's got these uh, 3D printed wheels, which is pretty cool. So you actually mm -hmm. use the filament to uh, to make the wheels. And in this one, I've actually put um, a wireless charger. So a bit like your iPhone can charge up. There's like the, all the electronics there. You can just see that little circuit board with some wires. 
So if that goes over um, an accompanying coil, you can charge the battery up without ever touching any wires. So that's pretty cool. And this one has the, uh, it has a little board there and you plug your MicroPython, your Raspberry Pi chip in and kind of go from there. So Pim Roney do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I, I do all the introduction videos to their, their products on their website. So they have things like this little display. You can plug that into a, a Pico. They have um, that uh, weather station stuff. There we go. They have this uh, thing called Enviro air quality hat mm -hmm. and that plugs on top of the Raspberry Pi into those little pins that you've seen. And it even has like a little screen on the top there, which is pretty cool. And that can like measure pressure, humidity, temperature. You can build your own weather station. And that one even comes with this like little, um, it's a little sensor that can measure particulates in the air. So it can measure like really fine particles and tell you if the air quality is good or bad. So mm -hmm. yeah, companies like Adafruit. It sounds, to me, it sounds like they're not going to teach it to you in a computer science degree, a robotics exactly. degree. They may <laughs> skip this part. Um, I speak from experience. <laughs> yes. It's too fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have a question here from LinkedIn. Uh, James, we actually just answered this one. So if you're re-watching this stream, just go back a few minutes uh, behind and Kevin just answered. What's the perfect beginner's robotic kit? Uh, but definitely check it out. Uh, so we have only a few questions because Kevin <laughs> is a busy guy. I don't want him to stay here for three hours. And my spouse is sick, so I need to go make him some soup. So <laughs> we're going to finish this stream after an hour. Um, and there's not going to be today, and I'm sorry, there's not going to be a uh, members uh, stream only. There's not going to be an after party, but only today. We will have a nice stream in three days. We'll have an after party, and everything will be fine. It's just today is a special day where soup is very important. <laughs> and I'm the only one qualified to make it. Okay? So... I have two more questions. I have a question about Alexa somewhere. Mina asked, what do you think of robot ideas like Alexa? Interesting. Yeah. So this is an example of a robot that doesn't have any moving parts. It's just like a, a headless voice. So a voice assistant, they are really fun to build. So you can build your, I think the most popular video on my channel is how to build your own AI assistant. So using Python, you can get it to convert text, uh, speech to text using a speech to text um, recognizer. You can then do um, text to speech the other way around so it can speak back to you. And when you've got code that can do that, it's so funny. It feels like you're talking to a real person, even though it's just code. Uh, and then how can you make it do things like, you know, add items to a to, to, to a to do list or add items to a calendar? So you need some kind of skills framework. So how do you build that out? So I've got videos on, on how to do exactly that on my YouTube channel. Uh, but yes, that's a really fun one to do because there's so much you can do with it. And now that we've got a llama where you can uh, build like a chat GPT type thing on a Raspberry Pi or on your local computer without any kind of paid subscription, that means there's so much more possibilities. So yeah, I, I absolutely try that out. That's a, a cool robot. So if you guys are looking for links to Kevin's social media, his channel is there as well in the description. I left a whole bunch of links. He even has an Instagram. A lot of you guys are on Instagram. I'm not there. So follow Kevin instead. <laughs> awesome. And I think we'll go to the last question, which I think is very, very important. Uh, what are some of the must-have pieces of equipment in your lab? Great question. So... I have over here, you might have seen me switch off before, I have a power supply. So this has um, some little crocodile clips you can connect to electronics and you can adjust how much power this provides. So is it like five volts? Is it 10 volts? What what do you need for your robot to work? So that, that old robot that's uh, there, that's an Omnibot from like 1984. Um, I, I got this on eBay. What are you? <laughs> so. I've always wanted one of these and I've managed to find one. I've put, I put a Raspberry Pi inside it because like, why not? So um, yeah, that, that requires a, quite a lot more power because it's all fashioned. It, it wasn't particularly efficient. Um, batteries is a big thing. You need all kinds of battery packs. Um, you need screwdrivers. So I use the uh, iFixit kit. I've got this, uh, got my robot maker stickers on there, but this has all kinds of like, um, you can all the wire that's in there, different types of mm -hmm. screwdrivers that you you need to sort of plug in. You definitely need wires. <laughs> need all kinds mm -hmm. of like uh, um, wire cutters. Um, one of the most useful things I have is actually this, which is um, a caliper. So this can measure accurately 
the uh, you know the width of things. So if, if you wanted to design a robot that had a Raspberry Pi in it, you'd have to sort of measure you know what's the width of that case there, uh, and then you could put that into some software like Fusion 360 FreeCAD. So these are really cheap. I saw this in um, a hobby store and it was twenty dollars, and I bought this online for ninety eight p, like ninety eight wow. cents. So you know, shop around <laughs> AliExpress. I Absolutely. Was. Yeah. Awesome. So, Kevin, do you have your own 3D printer or do you go to yes, a... Got some... Okay, yeah, if I go awesome. Back to, can you see? So you can see here on that little... Maybe if I go to that view there, mm -hmm. you can just about see this is the 3D printer I've just got here. Um, yeah, there you go. I've got one there and I've got one over the other side as well. So I've got two 3D printers. It looks pretty busy in here. It is always messy. <laughs> but yeah, it's okay. Um, it means you're busy. <laughs> and they're constantly on most of the time I've been quite noisy so i've not gone on during the stream but um yeah i'm always printing out stuff i made a robotic egg cup <laughs> so this i love again, this one <laughs> yep, so how did you end up there. calling him <laughs> um what was the best one that i asked on uh, instagram and twitter what what name should i give this and there's some like really fun ones that came out I, i'll definitely have to pick the best one there but um i think egg 2g was the best one i liked because it's like r2d2 egg mm. 2g e2g because it's two Gs for egg, and it has like a little servo on the on the back there. That little blue thing is a servo, and this little hammer will uh, will crack the egg. So we can connect <laughs> a, a Raspberry Pi Amazing. on the bottom. Yeah, if you think it, you've got to awesome. make it. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I'm just, it's just amazing that you can think of an idea and then you design it and you kind of think which equipment does it need? Exactly. What do I want to do with it? And you basically have your own servant that breaks eggs <laughs> forever. <laughs> Amazing. Exactly. I love it. I love robotics in general, but I find that my I don't have a lot of capacity to understand the engineering processes. So every time when it comes to physics and engineering, I have a blackout and I'm surrounded by engineers. <laughs> my dad is a mechanic engineer. My brother is going to be an electric engineer. My spouse is a uh, um, HVAC mechanic. It's like air conditioning and stuff like that. So every time each of them talks to me about things that have to do with microcontrollers or with circuit boards or whatever it That's is, it. my brain turns off. You'll find that all that stuff you learned at school that you thought, I'm never going to need algebra. Well, actually, <laughs> programming is algebra. <laughs> Trigonometry, yeah. you know, triangles and stuff. You'll never need to know Pythagoras' theorem. Well, actually, if you do anything with circles and servos, uh, you know, operating circular motions, that might come in handy inverse kinematics so Absolutely. yeah all kinds of stuff that will become useful but so go to school kids and learn everything don't skip it you'll need it <laughs> awesome well thank you so much kevin it was a pleasure having you here you and it, it, it's amazing how many topics we were able to talk about and how we even combined python with something that seemingly doesn't even you know nobody knows that python is involved mm -hmm. in robotics it's incredible um Thank you so much. It's a Thank pleasure. You and you guys follow Kevin right now. You can find all his information in um, in the description. And Kevin, if you'd like to let people know where is the best place to find you? Yes. Where do you so prefer you to, them to be? Yeah, if you go to kevsrobots.com, that's probably the easiest, find, easiest way to find my content. You'll see blog posts there with links to videos, code, MicroPython code, and so on. So kevsrobots.com, that's the easiest way to find stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. Thank you for all the questions and have a fantastic day. Bye-bye.